Welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to have uh, uh, you all here uh, on this snowy uh, beginning of winter night. Um, I'm Jenny Mish. I'm the interim executive director of the Sustainable Business Council, and um, we're delighted to have with us um, Dave Martin today from Blackfoot Communications. I want to um, introduce the event first by saying um, thanks to our, our sponsors. We have wonderful quesadillas from Taco Sano, and they, this is the first time that Taco Sano has ever um, offered quesadillas in a, a catering kind of environment. So there's a little question, a questionnaire back there. They really wanted to get some feedback to find out if it worked. So if you wouldn't mind filling that out, they would appreciate that. And we also have um, drinks from Liquid Planet and Big Sky um, Brewing, so thanks to them for that. And then we have a number of other sponsors that have sponsored our SHOT series, our sustainability SHOT series this fall. We've had three events and this is the third one. Um, so we um, had uh, uh, support from Family Dental Group and Portico Real Estate Energetics, Cherry Creek Radio, Sinelco Solar, Missoulian Independent, the Missoula Independent, and of course the Loft here. So um, we're happy to to be here. Um, this is the last event in our fall series, and then uh, next spring we'll have um, uh, 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 more events coming up. So stay tuned for those. So um, we our fall series um, of sustainability shots has focused on steps toward on the sustainability highway, and um, today we're looking at um, following the bits on the. IT portion of that highway. Um, so our speaker, um, Dave Martin, is coming from Blackfoot Communications, I'm which, <laughs> as you all know, the IT can can be um, have a mind of its own, <laughs> and Dave will help us through that process yeah. because. So um, Dave actually um, is an entrepreneur. He founded three companies, two of them in Montana and uh, one of them in California, um, providing, um, designing and providing data networking services for f Fortune 1000 companies along the West Coast. So he's been a go-getter in his career. He's really got expertise in the evolution of telecommunications, particularly in rural areas. So we've got a nice, you know, sort of perspective on how things have changed uh, during a lot, a period of really rapid change. He also spent a few years at Lawrence, Lab Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, where a lot of engineers and scientists, uh, you know, crunch the latest cutting edge things. And he was there developing technologies that support secure communications over fiber in top secret installations. And he was also involved in designing elements of FDDI, dun, 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 which is Fiber Distributed Data Interface Networks. And so he joined Blackfoot Communications in 1996, where he championed the conversion of Blackfoot to an all IP communications network, which made um, Blackfoot one of the first companies in the country to do so. So please help me welcome um, tel telecommunications expert Dave Martin from yeah. Blackfoot Communications. Oh, and the format for tonight is he'll talk for about 20 minutes and then Q&A. So be thinking about Q&A questions that you have, and he's also interactive. I've, oh I, I found out. <laughs> Okay, can I talk really loud? Yeah. Okay. So, let me, let me first set the stage by saying, you know, if you guys are expecting something serious, reverent, informative, you got to go somewhere else. Because if serious is here, I'm over in the parking garage somewhere right now, okay? Oh, then what? I can, I can. Oh, don't, okay. And I don't know about you guys, but when they said the shot series, I was expecting a lineup of little glasses with a... Anyway, so the, the title, when I, when I sent them the, the, uh, the title of the, the talk, I hadn't yet written the talk. So it's not the same title. And so I figured, you know, everything's got to have an intro slide, right? So this is it, the mandatory intro slide. Oh, and I'm supposed to push buttons to make things go. OK. So this is what we're going to talk about. Realize that I am a strategist, a technology strategist. I am not a technical expert. 
okay? So if you guys are going to ask me questions about how to configure something in the little tiny pieces, I know really, really smart people, they're brilliant, that can do those things. I can't, okay? It's a joke around work, by the way. <laughs> okay, a little bit about Blackfoot because it's incumbent upon me to tell, us, tell you a little bit. We were actually started in 1954 by a group of farmers out in Clinton, right? Phone companies in those days, they, they didn't have the money to serve sparsely populated areas. So REA, Rural, Elect Rural Electrification, um, funded cooperatives to go ahead and start their own little phone companies. And that's what, what happened. In fact, one of the founder's grandsons still works in our company, and one of the founder's sons is on our board of directors. Um, by 95, we were serving 22 communities all wrapped around Missoula, from Phillipsburg to Thompson Falls to St. Ignatius, 6,500 square miles, only 14,000 people. Okay. We were the first rural company in America to transition to all IP. What this means is we actually, in 2001, started an initiative. We designed and pushed fiber out really deep into our networks, and we converted all voice communications into IP streams. And so I have a particular hot button when people say VoIP, you send it over the internet. No, VoIP is a protocol. It is, does not instantly mean it goes on the internet. We use standard VoIP technologies, but it's all on private networks. And so at any rate, hugely successful. It cut our costs by two thirds, our annual um, licensing expenses and stuff. It was an amazing uh, uh, event. We, over the years, have grown. We just this year purchased a couple more companies. We serve all of um, the major um, towns in Montana and eastern Idaho now. Um, as you say, 99% of all of them. A non-IT factoid. I hate gardening. This is just me. Okay, I hate it with a passion. However, I really like to do cool stuff with our employee, employee group. So I set aside a square back in our yard for a garden. It took off. The last two years, we've donated over 300 pounds to the food bank. And it's good that other people like gardening because it sucks. <laughs> they die. They die if you don't do stuff with them. I don't understand it. Okay. This is the Blackfoot network. Um, and it's very quick. These are all 10 gig links. This is a 400 gig link that goes up here. These are all 1 gig links. And these can all be increased any size you want at the turn of a dime. The comments about well, Missoula not having bandwidth coming to this town are somewhat in error. Um, <laughs> and we're not the only one. I mean, all of, our, all of our worthy competitors have just as much bandwidth coming through town. Very, very fat pipes. We're on a major route between Chicago, Minneapolis, and Seattle. So there, there's just lots of data flowing through there. So on to the stuff that you're here to, to listen to. In our, in, so Blackfoot, we have always looked at things from a green perspective, but not because we're ben benevolent, okay? The bottom line is, saves us money. I mean, we've got to run a business. We're a cooperative. Those people invested their hard-earned dollars in us, and, and, and we have to return something for it. So when we designed and built our campus, it's up on the north end of Russell Street, very large campus. It takes up a whole city block. Um, the main corporate office, very large. Right from the get-go, heated and cooled via ground source heat pumps. We um, installed about six years ago a lighting management um, system. So it's motion sensors, right? You walk into a room, lights come on. Um, we replaced all of our lighting with um, fluorescence and um, or CFLs and, um, and thin tube fluorescence. Payback for that whole transition was only two and a half years, and now we're making money off it. A great thing to undertake, by the way. You can get assistance from the power company. The power company actually provided a, um, an engineer to come through and recommend the changes we could make to um, save dollars. Um, all of our, all of our um, air conditioning systems, cooling and heating, are on timetables, so off hours. <clears throat> it's flipping cold in there, you know? <laughs> and then when you walk in, you can actually hit a button and it'll turn on the heat for, I think, an hour, um, but in, in each zone. But off hours, everything shuts down, and just before people arrive, everything comes back up to speed and heats the place. Same for cooling. Um, our data center, we have a very nice data center, quite honestly, and it is all cooled through ground source heat pumps. We actually carefully monitor the temperature of the water we're putting back in the ground. We use what's called open loop. 
So basically, we sunk a couple of big wells. We pump water out, which is cooler, run it through systems inside the building. We have to monitor the temperature, the city, the um, whoever the, the, the water gods are. They, they, they monitor that and tell us, you know, hey, you're pumping too much heat back in or not or whatever. And, and so, um, but it dramatically cuts um, our, our cost of cooling the data center. In addition, we use what's called in-row cooling. I know this is horribly exciting for all of you guys. I can tell by the, <laughs> no, but, um, but, so if you think of it, we have these line, lineups of, compu of uh, racks, right? Lots of racks up and down. So you can either cool the whole room, right, to try to keep those things cool, or you can use other methods which are more, more focused for cooling the equipment. We use one that's called um, hot aisle, cold, cold aisle. And that technology actually reduced our cooling expense by over 50%. We were using a kind of a general room cooling um, style. And the technology is advanced enough that we implemented it and it's been a dramatic savings. And it's far more efficient. I mean, when you walk, when you walk in there, you, can, you, know, you open up the cabinets and boom, it's just cold air. But if you walk between the aisles, it's hotter than blue blazes, you know, and so uh, it's very interesting, actually, technology. The cloud. We'll momentarily talk about the cloud, okay? <laughs> Cloud's an interesting environment. There's tremendous benefit to the cloud. For people like me who are charged with protecting information, our insurance company, we have a, a cyber insurance company, right? We have a huge cyber insurance policy. When we met with them to negotiate our last one, they brought us all t-shirts that said, fear the cloud, okay? <laughs> the, the cloud has tremendous benefits. It also has tremendous risks. Today, 75%, so the last study that I saw from Gartner Group said 75% of all corporate applications in America, 75% um, are on the cloud. But only 35% of corporations actually have at least one application on the cloud. So you have this, this um, strange effect where, where only 35% of the companies in America have chosen to put applications on the cloud, but those that have, uh, they put a lot of applications there. For somebody like Blackfoot, we have a legal requirement to protect information. There is not a single cloud provider in the, in the United States, and we would never go outside the United States because we'd be subject to foreign laws then when there, as it regards um, the information out there. There's not a single cloud provider in the United States that will guarantee the protection of your information. If, if we lose the customer's social security number or um, credit card number, we're liable, not the cloud provider, because we're the service provider connected to the end user. Court battle after court battle has supported that view. So we're very careful. We use a lot of cloud technology, but we also build a lot of cloud technology internally, so they're called private clouds. Right, and so, can I work my little machine? Okay, there. This, we have an internal private cloud. We also provide public cloud services to customers, remote data backup. Um, everybody who gets an internet connection from us gets a certain amount of storage space, you know. I mean, there's a number of things like that. Over the years, we had all of these racks of standalone um, computers running all of our software, right? Internal and external software. So in 2006, we converted to what are called blade servers. Instead of having racks of computers sitting, you know, like that, right, we have one chassis, and we have just basically plug-in cards, and each card is actually a server, right? Now that we even have cards that are two or four servers. Um, and so that helped. But the big step was in 2009, we finally completed the implementation of what's called a uh, virtual server environment. Um, and so in software, we create virtual servers. And we assign multiple virtual servers to um, these blade servers. Okay? It's kind of esoteric if you're not actually interested in that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, what it means is that a given server is only in the ether. It has no permanent home. And it's only assigned a permanent home when it needs to be used. The biggest thing for us, 80% reduction in power consumption. Massive. We went from 50 actual hard servers, like think of computers, stacking in a rack, right? 50 of them, over 50 actually, 
to 40 virtual servers on seven blades. That's just seven little plug-in cards replaced racks and racks of these big servers. And we actually have more <coughs> performance cap um, capability out of this. We can also, if somebody needs a server, we can go in and in 30 minutes actually turn up a new server because it's just virtual. It doesn't really exist any place. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the change to IP switching. It was interesting. We, our power consumption, when we changed, we dropped from 800 square feet of, of floor space to 36 square feet. The power consumption in our main office here went from 156 kilowatt hours to 15 kilowatt hours per day, a, a 90 percent decrease. Understand we also have 22 remote buildings, Thompson Falls, St. Ignatius, all of these far-flung places, right? Each one of them had standard old big switching boxes. Those were also converted literally to maybe a half a rack, right? And so this is what the old world looked like. These green things, those are the ends of what we call lineups. We had 15 of them in Missoula that were 27 feet long. That's me when I had hair and was taller, <laughs> okay? So that was our world, and that was every telco's world. Huge producers of heat, huge power consumers. That is now what replaced it, and this has twice the capacity of all of those other great big cabinets, right? And out in our remote places, as I said, we have less than a half a rack in each one of those remote buildings, whereas before they had two to probably two of those lineups of those huge cabinets. Um, a, a huge decrease in, um, in cost of cooling, cost of electric, electrical consumption, cost of licensing. Um, this is actually, I, I just threw it in here because I really like it. So <laughs> it's, um, this, is our, this is just a portion of our data center. These are really cool looking. If you like, like really cool, sleek looking black racks and stuff, and <laughs> that's very cool. And this is these big old pipes right here. They feed all of our, that hot aisle, cold, cold aisle um, cooling system. This is the end of a lineup that actually drives the, the cooling air through it. So our whole data center is piped with all of those big black pipes overhead. And anywhere we want to drop cabinets or rows of cabinets, we just tap into those big old pipes and drop that cooling capability in there. I think it's cool. And after all, I am giving the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so what are we doing as we move forward? Some of this we're already doing. Some of it's future focused. I screwed up on the title, so don't pay attention. It's, so it's multifaceted, right? Five syllables all at once. So we, we do continue to um, promote and use green, um, green services or green efforts within our company. We have, for many, many years, um, recycled paper, right? We recycle plastic and aluminum. Everywhere you go on our campus, we have bins that are totally separated for it. Um, we do consider supply chain characteristics. We, we are a cooperative, thankfully, um, very focused on um, getting content from North America, right? Making sure that to the extent we can, everything we buy is, um, has a level of um, greenness. God, I can't think of a good term for it. Okay, so we recycle like crazy. Actually, five years ago, we tried to, we had a program where we tried to recycle dry cell batteries. You know, single A, double A, triple A, C, D, and whatever other little word that might be up there. It was a resounding failure, right? We had little buckets all over the place. And to this day, they still are sitting there. Not a single one of them has ever been filled. It's, you're fighting human nature. Uh, there's, a, there's a certain thing. Most of the dry cells are used by our technicians out in the field. So for them to say, whenever they switch out, put them somewhere in the truck. And then when they come in, go find a bucket. And then go ahead and put it in there. That was issue number one. Number two was, um, Finding some place that would actually recycle. We have to ship these to Minnesota, right? Huge trucking expenses. It, the batteries are heavy. And so at the end of the day, it just failed. And as I say, the buckets are still there. Cons we'll, we will continue to consolidate. We'll continue to outsource 
um, services like software as a service where we actually um, go to some big provider in the sky you know and use their service it's more um, energy efficient because these guys scale up really big so on a per um, computing cycle they can do it cheaper than we can so where they don't have to house secure data we, we absolutely continue down that path and use them as much as possible and we'll continue to do so where secure data has to leave the premises now the guy in charge of that says no so that'd be me <laughs> um, we'll continue virtualization and so um, one aspect we're really looking into it you know it, it there was a big flurry a while ago about desktop virtualiz virtualization meaning that basically your whatever device you have you log in and your whole um, profile appears on the device whether you're at a desktop or wherever I, I love it I want it to happen it's just not ready for us yet um, the costs are very high there's um, when we get to that point then we can divorce ourselves from having to so tightly control the devices people use we have to do that for security you know there's some devices I just can't allow on campus because I can't I can't guarantee the security of the information they use because it resides on their device once we get to virtualization they come on campus they log in they work through a browser and they're doing their you know doing their job doing whatever and when they shut off that device there's none of that information on their device it's still sitting back in our virtual servers that little all of those servers that exist in the ether um, so at any rate PowerPoint this is a particular thing for me I know PowerPoint people you know complain about geez PowerPoint then PowerPoint fact of the matter is I, I really hate walking into meetings and seeing people having printed out reams of paper either they printed out the presentation which really drives me crazy or they have printed out documentation instead what we really want to do is um, portable communications environments make sure everybody has a tablet I'm not a big Apple fan but that's another story um, but um, there's there's plenty of tablets out there that you know that are convenient um, notebooks things like that so that the material they're working with is ever present on an electronic device instead of printing out pages and pages and pages of information to haul into a meeting bring your device into the meeting sit down relax have a beer well <laughs> wait okay so um, here's some more things that we use at Blackfoot we actually have GP ena enabled um, routing of all of our vehicles so the we, we have a system that knows where all of our vehicles are and looks at what work has to be done and then between both taking advantage of time and um, fuel consumption we can route the right people to the right place at the right time works really well we have reporting systems that report our energy use you know and so and and IT services can continue to expand on that we use smart boards like crazy we have offices in Idaho and Bozeman and Missoula we have smart boards in all those environments the engineers it looks like minority report they get on that board and their arms are flying and things are shooting to the corners and their stuff expanding and contracting and it gives makes me seasick so here's some other stuff that I just like okay because I threw it in because I figured the whole first two-thirds of it was boring as a Dickens so here's here's the rest of it self-piloting cars huge fuel savings are projected right believe it or not Nevada Florida California uh, have passed legislation to allow self-piloting cars in test mode on the highways um, they're expecting actually to be able to sell vehicles by 2020 yeah we've expected a lot of things we'll see um, I like it um, so anyway you can see the fuel savings are uh, tremendous hot data centers maybe to most of you guys this isn't a big deal but this is so cool to me they literally Dell and Microsoft got together and did some pilot programs where they moved cargo containers out there out behind some building they stuffed it full of servers no active cooling they literally drilled holes you know low against the ground on one side high against the ground on the other and then ran the system for months they um, the average temperature hit 104 but none of the equipment ever failed because modern <coughs> manufacturing techniques now allows this equipment to run really hot 
I do question about technicians having to go in there. I hate to see a bunch of technicians running in there in bikini briefs. <laughs> but at any rate, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a great, it's a, a, a great smart homes. Obviously, you guys hear lots about that. We've heard lots about it for many, many years. We're starting to see traction. Actually, people starting to use it. It's less expensive. It's more easy to configure by a home user. Um, it's more dynamic, more interactive. And so um, controlling virtually anything. Smart water is very cool. It reduces water consumption. I can't remember the brand, so I wrote smart water to remind myself. So it actually controls the output of the water, but it shapes the water drops so that sensation on your skin feels like you're, you're actually having a, a very high flow of water, but it reduces the water flow by over 30%. It was very cool, I thought. But I'm easily impressed. Smart grid. This is um, managing the power grid. Um, it's a big, big deal. It saves billions and billions of dollars. It's been a long time coming. Blackfoot actually, six years ago, was the only telephone company that was a member of um, a national association for smart grid technology. And it was because we were very interested in actually running broadband over the electrical systems. Um, and they, it's phenomenal what they can do. They, now, only 10% of the grid environment is two-way, meaning you can, com you can communicate your, your home can communicate back to the um, electrical grid, but 75, I think it was 75% of the grid can communicate down to devices. So what that means is that the, the smart grid can actually communicate to your home and say, uh, it's th we're, we're seeing too much load, we're going to um, lower your energy use by actually going in, say, and cycling your refrigerator on and off, okay? Or we're going to go in and we're going to perhaps lower the amount of power we send to your um, hot water heater. Um, this is future stuff we're talking about, but this is a, a, a completely, you're going to see a thing up here that I'm going to briefly talk. I don't briefly talk very well, guys. I'm sorry about this. But you, we'll talk about the Internet of Things. It's, it's fascinating, scary, and fascinating. Remote medical center uh, services, I just got done doing um, at a presentation down in Idaho. And a large component of it was talking about remote medical services, um, connecting people in rural America to advanced medical services. Folks, there's, there's a, um, a vest that um, some folks can wear, and it sends all of the vitals, blood pressure, everything remotely. Um, remote diagnostics, there's another company that, I don't know if it's there, no. There's a company that makes a little puck that plugs into a smartphone. It'll do, um, it measure your heart rate, your blood pressure, your um, blood alcohol, or blood alcohol. Well, it'll measure that too. <laughs> but, <laughs> but your oxygen saturation in your blood, it'll perform your analysis, and it'll, perf it'll, um, it, it'll uh, rate your liver functions. And um, so that's where the alcohol thing came in. But anyway, it costs 150 bucks, and it plugs into your smartphone. You know, that technology has taken off so quickly, it is absolutely amazing. And it's based on the need to serve um, a wider range of folks, elderly who can't move around very, very well, um, rural America, very sparse, um, and the ability to provide very high quality care to remote clinics through telecommuting or uh, you know, video, video conferencing, remote hands, doing operations on people from 300 miles away. You know, all, all of those technologies are fascinating, just fascinating. The Internet of Things. I, look it up. Just look it up. This is something that I've, I've been to a couple of conferences on. And um, it's a Cisco invention as far as the term goes. But it's a very real, frightening, and exciting kind of future. When you think about it, think about RFID chips. Little tiny things, they look like a flake of pepper, right? Um, in manufacturing, they embed these in clothing, in shipping and stuff. So they can track inventory through shipping. Um, I mean, they can route stuff automatically, right? The Internet of Things is a concept that says, look, um, IPv6, it's a new way to um, create IP addresses for things. The new way says that we have so many IP addresses available that we could address every single thing in the world. 
right, and never run out. What that says is that every single thing can have a unique address. And because these little RFID chips and other small components can be, a, it, they're so tiny, they're like smaller than a grain of sand, they can be embedded in everything. So imagine walking down the street, okay? The street knows who you are. It knows it from your smartphone. It knows it from an RFID chip that's embedded in the shirt that you bought with your credit card. And it was that, that shirt was identified to you as that purchaser. The people who are monitoring your buying habits know that you bought that shirt and you frequent this street. And that billboard over there, as you pass by, is going to come up with an advertisement that is tailored to catch your attention. And as you move through your environment, you walk into the store, you walk down the aisles, right? They know your buying habits. Hey, I know that you like uh, Fido fresh food for your cat or something like that, you know? And so woo, a, a light, it slowly highlights that bit of food in the shopping area. You move on out through and, and further down the street. You go into a restaurant, right? Oh, by the way, it, it knows that, you know, your favorite kind of music, because we see you on Spotify all the time, is X. To improve your <coughs> mood when you're in there, we might go ahead and just slowly fade in some music that you really like. You move into your house. So all of this, it sounds sci-fi-ish, but believe me, th this is stuff that is emerging. People don't realize, you know, you think about the, the fiber to the home, that project that Google is doing, and people think, oh, that'd be so cool to have it and everything. And that, it's true. However, how do you think Google funds that? They don't care how much they sell it for. They fund it because today Google is a massively successful company because they sell all of your habits, surfing habits. But today they can only sell the information about what you do whenever you're using a Google service. If you do a Google search, if you use Gmail, right, then they know what your patterns are. But what happens if they have fiber to your house and everything you do on the internet is now tracked through Google, okay? They now know everything you do on the internet. And this is not nefarious. I'm not trying to paint a picture of, oh, you know. What I'm saying is that that information is hugely valuable. And so it just increases their ability to understand your habits and then more ably target um, basically marketing towards you. So, anyway, interesting concepts. Uh, look up Internet of Things. It's just so fascinating. I mean, the future of what will happen when you're just walking around and the world adapts to who you are and what you want and what you normally do. It, it's just, as I say, frightening and fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, these are, the last, these are the last eight things, okay? What to do when you, get go when you want to try to do this. First, set realistic goals. Too many people try to over overachieve in, uh, too quickly. Assign a champion. You have to have somebody that's going to carry the water at all times and not give up. If you don't, whoop. Um, plan, plan, plan. Yeah, you know, that's part of getting it done. Prepare. Audit your systems. Like, you know, figure out how much am I spending on lights? How much am I spending on water? How much am I, you know, f know what your baseline is before you get started so you can measure the gains and, and val verify. Be open-minded. Ideas come from the strangest places. I have a story to tell about Spain and an idea, but I can't, I'm not going to. Um, but <laughs> budget. You got to have a realistic budget. This stuff costs money. And another important part is, I, where's my fancy little pointer? I love it. Right here. If you've got a small operation, you may not spell, save enough money to offset the cost of implementing some of this stuff. That's a reality. So. Is, is dollar saved the only measure of success? That's a question you have to ask yourself. If it is better for the planet, better for the community, better for your employees, and it costs you a little more, is it still a good thing to do? That's a question that only you can answer. Publicly celebrate the wins. Get out there and tell people, Facebook, Twitter, you know, whatever, hey, our company did this and it was so cool, it was wonderful, you know. It actually increases basically the, the, the public's good feeling about your company and what you're attempting to do. Um, and most importantly, this is really critical to me, have fun. It's just, it's a great world and enjoy it, you know. That's all I have to say. <laughs> oh, and I have. Clearly, clearly David knows how to have fun. Yeah. <laughs> a number of topics that you all, 
you all have questions about. He covered a lot of terrain, and, um, some of it futuristic and practical and detailed. So um, no question is uh, too small uh, for, uh, to go forward. Who would like to pose a question? Kara. Yes. Um, so I don't know how fast IT stuff, new stuff keeps on coming out, but um, when you made that switch over to the smaller servers, was that kind of an iffy point for you to wait out for newer technology to wait? No, you know, actually we, we planned it out for a while and it was a matter of we can keep buying box after box after box or we can just go ahead and make the leap now. And um, the cards themselves, the virtualization, if that's where you're going, um, it, it is more future-proofed at a lower cost than replacing 50 individual hardware servers on a three-year cycle. So I can upgrade software or replace a blade if I have to, a lot less expense. Okay. You, get, you get one of these things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Colin. Oh, thanks for your presentation. Um, I was curious with the private clouds, mm -hmm. um, is that only, is it like a, a hard drive connected to your computer? Can you only access it from one IP address? No. And if not, how is it private? It's private because it's only accessible over a private network. Okay? So, so Blackfoot has a private network that extends from Missoula to Bozeman to Idaho. It's completely private. Our traffic does not run over the internet. They're dedicated circuits that connect those properties. And so we have virtual servers on um, blade architecture. And so it, that is the cloud environment. If you think about a cloud environment, that it's, it's a ton of virtualization. But, but um, cloud comes in three varieties, private, public, and hybrid. Okay? And private is just, it's the same kind of technology but it's only accessible over private network connections rather than public. Can only access it from, oh, you can only access it from Blackfoot. Yes, okay. from Blackfoot network. network. Yeah, so it could be any one of our 200 computers, desktop computers, right? Anywhere on our network, just not over the internet. So I think one of the most inspiring parts about having a business that's sustainable is um, like an educational facet. And with Blackfoot Communications, you have such a far reach. Can you think of any ways to incentivize like wise energy use or efficiency for your customers? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, think, I think that's a great question. And I'm stumbling because I'm thinking, hmm, see, what we focus on when we think of education of our, of our customers is wise use of communications. There's a tangential effect um, to say, look, and I didn't touch on this and I apologize, that, um, you know, use, um, um, use video conferencing instead of getting in the car. Um, you know, you use all of those remote technologies to connect you to the office. I mean, today they can take their business phone if it's an IP phone, home and work from home, perfectly fine. From that perspective, that education does happen frequently. When it comes to direct energy use policy, or, or and, you know, we look to people like Missoula Electric Co-op, who we have a, a very strong affiliation with. In fact, they're the ones who came in, as I said, and engineered our our um, energy improvement plan. <laughs> I'm sure there are other questions. One of the questions I had was to ask you to talk a little bit more about cooperatives. You just mentioned the electric co-op. Sure. How the, the cooperative business model operates, because there's some sustainability components of that, and in particular, you know, how, how you've benefited from being a cooperative. So the, the way the cooperative, at least our cooperative works, is, as I said, it started off with a bunch of farmers in Clinton, right? And so every customer of Blackfoot in the rural territories. This is not our competitive business enterprises in the rest of Montana and Idaho. This is our original 22 rural communities, right? Every person who buys service, a percentage of the cost of that service, a percentage of the bill they pays, they pays? Mm. The percentage of the bill they pay actually 
um, becomes an investment in the company. They actually earn, um, they develop, if you will, shares within our company. They get dividend checks most years um, based on those um, shares. And so they have voting rights. They, they, elect, they elect a board of directors to basically oversee um, Blackfoot in our strategic plans and directions. Um, we have a very close relationship with our board of directors, as does our customer base. They're the go-between between us all. So not all customers are owner members of the cooperative, just in those 22 counties? Just in those 22 communities. The, the, um, because the cooperative charter is very restricted to those rural environments, those 22 rural environments. Um, in the business environment, that's a very, very competitive environment. Um, and honestly, what we, the reason we even go into that environment, that we do all these other things, the rural environment is very expensive to deploy telephone services. If, as you can imagine, we cover 6,500 square miles, 14,000 users. Okay? And in Seattle, they get 14,000 users in six square blocks. So the, the, you know, much less expensive environment. So we go out and, and do for-profit work to feed that money back into the cooperative to offset the, the normal increased cost of doing business in the cooperative. So we can keep their rates at least close to what people in um, larger areas provide. There's other elements. There's some government funding and things like that, but that can, continues to dry up, so we continue to so that's be more aggressive. That's an illustration of the social component of sustainability in the total bottom line as well as the environmental. So, so the Blackfoot, uh, Blackfoot Communications is fully owned by the cooperative, or is it yes. a separate corporation? No. The, well, so the cooperative owns a holding company, and the holding company owns all of the um, for-profit companies below it. Thank you. You're welcome. And you get one of these, too. Another question. Who's got another question? Angelica. I enjoyed your presentation. Oh, thanks. Um, I was wondering, it, it seemed like uh, Blackfoot was so innovative, visionary, and uh, even maybe courageous to uh, implement all these changes, because usually everybody wants the status quo, like big established. Like, was it all just? really cut and dry, obvious, oh, we just got to do this, or was there any kind no. of hurdles? To, and, and how did you guys do it? You know, remember the, the one thing up here was um, having a champion? So I, I'm a very strong believer in vision. You establish vision. That, that actually is what I do. I, you know, I'm a strategic guy. I established strategic vision or work towards that with a bunch of people. And, and so Blackfoot actually entered the mobile wireless business in 96. And then we actually deployed a fixed wireless broadband service in 97. You know, I mean, what happened was the government has provided subsidies for rural America. But the government has been flip-flopping about how long they'll be sustained, yada, yada. We saw many, uh, quite a while ago that, A, we need to cut costs, we need to provide advanced services, and we need to figure out cheaper ways to do business. So we need to you know, go far astray from where the rest... There's 1,200 rural telephone companies in America. I guarantee you, we go to conferences and it's a constant... We are still way outside of the norm for those folks. We actually, when we deployed um, IP um, in our switching and our distribution network, we actually had to work with the equipment manufacturers to design the equipment to be able to provide that because they were only using the equipment for very large companies that were transporting calls overseas. They had never really dealt in, you know, the just North American rural kind of telephony. And so it was a matter of saying, look, we know these are the things we, and if we truly believe in our heart that these are the right things to do, we need to create a vision sa statement, we need to put it out there, and we need to just drive, you know, it's the North Star, the guiding star, we need to go there. It's not that the vision can't be modified with good reason, but there's got to be something that you drive toward. And um, very, I'm a very, very firm believer in that. And so, long-winded way of answering your question. Ben? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, great presentation. Uh, but, thanks. Um, yeah, I was wondering uh, about the virtualization. Mm -hmm. is, uh, what were all the jobs that actually Okay. <laughs> what were all the, all the costs that were actually uh, reduced by virtualizing? 
um, so that the, the costs were power consumption and hardware. Because if you think about um, 40, say, between 40 and 50 servers, okay, our servers run 7 to 10 grand a piece. All right, so you're looking at $500,000. Well, our, our um, Blade servers, pff, I think, ran around 40 grand, 45 grand for the, the, the shelf with the servers. And then our virtualization software, we're well below $100,000 for the whole system. Plus, as I say, we've reduced power consumption. Um, and on a going forward basis, we can easily spin up virtual servers within minutes almost. Um, and so, yeah, there. That's what I have to say. Okay, also, uh, sorry, <laughs> one more thing. Um, we had a lot of feedback last time, that's why I'm trying to keep you moving. Yeah. Go <laughs> um, like, what, what is the trend kind of going towards that for the, for the rest of the companies in your industry? Is that, is that really been a full takeover, or are a lot of companies still trying to jump on board and are really trying to hold back? On as far as? Um, Going really towards virtualization. Oh, you know, it's it's a clear path that that's the right direction. You know, there there's there's we have a wide range. Let's say there's 1,200 phone companies, 1,200 rural companies in the United States. There's another dozen or so large companies, right? So it, it's it, it's dependent on the size and skill sets within that company. Um, the vast majority of rural telephone companies aren't moving in this direction because they're they don't have the skill sets internal. Um, and to drive, and they have things that they're more worried about. Um, and, and there's a subset, you know, there's probably out of 1,200, there's maybe 100 of us that are in a completely different zone, if you will, you know, that have moved down that road. They will all have to go there um, because at some point in time it will become ridiculously expensive to do anything else. But that could be 10 years from now, quite honestly. Depends on what services they're trying to offer also. Is it driving them to deploy a lot more servers? Or is their, stat, uh, is their status quo just fine and they'll just run it until, until pff, uh, the, things rust and fall off the shelf? <laughs> mm -hmm. I really appreciate the efforts that you've made to reduce your energy consumption. Um, but the view that you've presented today is using a lot of technology mm -hmm. to drive this. And while I realize there are challenges in integrating low-tech solutions too, such as daylighting and passive heating and cooling, uh, ha have you had any success or tried to integrate these two modes? Yeah, you know, our buildings were built bluntly several years ago. And so, so the short answer is yes a little bit. Um, if you look at our main campus building, on the south side there's a big greenhouse. And that was specifically designed to improve heating in the winter months or, you know, um, so yeah. And, and so to the extent we could as they were constructed and to the extent we could within reasonable, um, within reasonable amount retrofit, yes. Um, but certainly not, if we were building a new building today, it would be entirely a different game. Um, so. That's where we are. Thank you. <laughs> you got to be fast. No. <laughs> I'm going to put somebody's eye out. I know I'm going to get sued. Uh. Hey, hey, Dave, really great presentation. Hey, thanks, Tom. One, one of the questions I have is, uh, have, do you have any tips? I, I think measurement is always a difficult process when you're doing this. Like how measuring the gains that you've, you've made over the past five or 10 years. Yeah. Do you have any tips on, on how maybe in your experience you guys get some measurement of that or, or maybe best practices? Yeah, you know, it, it's critical to, uh, you're, you're just right. So um, go and, and, and uh, so for instance, for us in the power systems that feed our servers, we actually meter the power consumption of the inline servers, right? Not everybody is going to be able to do that bluntly. It depends. I mean, if you've got two racks of servers, are you really going to spend 1500 bucks to get an inline metering system? So then what you need to do instead is carefully meter at the most discrete point. You can actually meter at a panel for not too much money, right? So set up those kinds of measurement points. Um, and, then, and then as you move forward, you know, you can see whatever, what changes are occurring 
um, after you implement changes. Um, and I, I, you know, honestly, Tom, that's that's all I got, man. That's <laughs> you know, it's 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 based on its power consumption. That's the big driver for us. Is in in from that perspective. Obviously, the dollars associated with different technology architectures, right? Um, those are easily measurable. But you're right, the power consumption is difficult. Now, measurement is really always a challenge with sustainability, particularly when you get into the intangible things, mm -hmm. so like some of your more social benefits and so forth, so it's always tricky. Another question here? Oh. Uh, one more question for you. Um, so <laughs> I have more. <laughs> are you afraid now? Uh, so right now it seems like a lot of companies are moving in the direction. There's there's a lot of research that shows you know a lot of things you're doing um, actually ends up being more profitable, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, but when you guys started back in '96 um, as a member-owned cooperative, how did you convince the member owners to do this at a time when it wasn't being done? So. So the, the way the co a cooperative works is the cooperative members are represented by a board of directors. We actually, for good or bad, don't have to convince the members. We have to convince the board of directors. And we do that by doing our homework, quite bluntly. I mean, you know, we, we don't do things, we're an analytical company. We actually have two economic analysts on in our company. And so we're very analytical. And, and when we go through these efforts, we say, look, here's what happens if we do it. Here's what happens if we don't. And in some case, it is swimming uphill. I, I, you're absolutely right. I, a great example is America was in love with fiber to the home. Okay, I, And I know people still are. But um, in rural America, overbuilding and putting fiber, what we like to call fiber to the barn, was very popular because rural telephone companies get funded by the government for their deployment of, of equipment and cable in the ground. The fact of the matter is, if I put fiber into your house, are you all of a sudden going to pay me five times as much as you were for your, for your internet service? No, right? But it cost me that much to put that fiber in there when I had perfectly good copper delivering 15 mega service to your house. And so that was an uphill battle for us because every conference that our board of directors went to, they were pitching fiber to the home, fiber to the home, get those federal dollars, your people will love you, you know. We were looking down the road and saying, what happens when that subsidy goes the way? We're going to be stuck with these huge loans of tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. And so it's, it's a relationship with the board of directors to convince them that what we're doing is smart and future-proof and, and taking us to you know, a, a, a really solid direction. I think you got one already, right? OK, good. <laughs> I might be too close to the speaker, so if I get feedback, I apologize. Um, the, yeah. <laughs> so I was kind of curious, you mentioned that you guys have your own cloud, basically, a private cloud. Yes. And I think you said that businesses could actually contract with you to use your cloud. No. No. Okay. So it was just for your <laughs> yeah. use. Our, we will build private cloud for, for a company. We have public cloud um, services that we do sell to customers. Our private cloud is sp strictly ours and doesn't connect to the outside world in any fashion. So are you then using some national entity to do the public cloud? or We, we actually have two grades of service, if you will. One is a commodity grade, and we do white label, it's called. We um, resell a national cloud provider service. The other is a higher grade um, storage service for a little bigger companies. And we actually have our own public cloud that we have at our data center for those folks. So you're, you're, you're really talking about, so to get the security of, of, that you're saying that you provide, it's pretty much the large entities that would use your public cloud versus the no. smaller folks are going to be on the white label. And no, 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 no. Any public cloud service is exposed, okay? So we make no guarantees, just as no one else does, in the um, security of your data. We do our best. Uh, believe me, we're not sitting there saying, hey, come on in, steal everything you want. No, we don't do that. Um, but, we, uh, um, but we won't guarantee that because, honestly, I mean, I, I saw a great presentation at the university just about four months ago. One of the foremost 
international security experts um, was talking about the, the, the difficulty of keeping up with viruses and hacking attacks and stuff. Somebody in the audience asked him, said, aren't you one of the foremost authorities in the, in the world? Yes, I am. And a great guy. And they said, well, so you're telling me they're smarter than you? And he goes, I'll tell you what. I work 10 hours a day, six days a week. When I'm done working, I go home, I play with my kids, I take my wife out to dinner, I might go golfing on the weekend. That hacker that's trying to break into our system is working 24 hours a day in a little dark corner in Uzbekistan, you know, and he's liable to make up to $100,000 for one successful virus. That's his whole world. He has an advantage, and I'm not willing to, you know. So it's very interesting perspective. So at any rate, that's why companies can't guarantee the sanctity of data. So if, if it's data you're worried about ever losing control of, don't put it on the public cloud. And I'm not an anti-cloud guy. Believe me, I'm not. I am very pro-cloud. Pro pro-cloud? That's a cool word to even say. Say it. Pro-cloud. <laughs> I'm going to pro-cloud that I like that word. And no, this is all I've had right here. <laughs> I'd throw this to you, but could you catch it? Uh, no. Okay. okay. I can catch it. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Okay. Is there another question? Yes. Um, like, it seems like, a, like I worked for PG and E, and uh, yeah? they were uh, down, downsizing like every quarter over the several years just to make their quarterly stock prices go up. And you know, we look at the government. And, a lot of common sense is just falling by the wayside. Uh, how come you guys have it? Why are you, like what, what, how do you guys maintain your common sense? I, <laughs> 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 oh, lordy. <laughs> you know, um, we have great folks in our company. We, we, we do have a clear vision. And we work hard to get the employees to buy into the vision. To, we, I mean, we all try to buy into it. I'm not, I'm not going to josh you, but um, you know, and not all employees, as you would expect in any group of people. There's a range of, you know, stars, middle, and would rather be somewhere. And so, and we have that in our company. It's like any company. Um, we we pay very well. We provide a really solid um, um, work environment. Um, we promote a lot of healthy things. We have a health committee. We have, you know, you can earn points and win jackets and all kinds of stuff for the number of miles you walk and all those kinds of things that go on in our company. Um, at the end of the day, too, though, um, we, we owe our cooperative owners a lot. We owe them our existence. We owe our customers our existence. That's the mantra in our company, our cooperative owners and our customers. And so um, the things we do, while some people look at them as you know, advanced and cutting edge, they're, they're things that we make decisions on to make sure, A, we're still here f another 50 years from now, providing very leading edge services to a rural community that normally wouldn't have access to it. Those, those people out there today, they can get um, you know, unified messaging. They get their voicemails on their email account. I mean, you know, I mean, they're sitting up here in Heron, you know, and, and getting these kinds of services. Um, and, and so there's a large faction of our company, of our employees, that buy into that, that desire, that vision of, you know, being that kind of provider. And we, we have the same um, philosophy when it goes to providing business services to businesses. We actually are not the lowest priced people around, you know. But we have a fantastic group of people that really believe in this, and they, you know, and, and so it's, it's kept everybody healthy and happy. And then it's good. Well, thank you so much, Dave. I'd like to offer you a 100% organic tote bag with the SBC logo on it. Just to say thank you for so being with if, us tonight. So if I leave it outside too long, will it just, like, disintegrate into the soil? and okay. into the soil. I'm sure it's completely, you know, disintegratable, uh, biodegradable. It was wonderful yeah. to have you with us. Oh, thank good. Thank you very much. Let's get, uh, Thanks. Okay. And never despair. I have enough for everybody. So <laughs> people who want a thumb drive, feel free. <laughs> so although this is our last sustainability shot of this season, um, and I, I would like to say that the, uh, the Sustainable Business Council raised the bar in the Doolittle Founded um, in 2002 by putting sustainability and business 
on MAP and, and creating a uh, discussion about it. We've had over 50 events, educational events through the years and uh, on very particular topics of interest to, um, to, to businesses and organizations around sustainability. We also um, raised the bar in 2008 when we launched um, a My Local program for the first time in Missoula and now there's lots of other organizations promoting um, local purchasing um, for lots of good reasons. And um, we um, uh, don't have any more uh, educational events until next year, um, but stay tuned for those. But we do have um, a bi-local program that is just launching this week, so you'll be seeing our ads in um, the newspapers and hearing them on the radio, and uh, we have a, a contest so that you can go to three merchants and snap a photo, photo of the QR code or take the phrase and plug it into a website, and we, um, uh, we'll have three monthly drawings. So. Um, please shop local for your holiday gift needs. And we also are going to have a um, First Friday event in, on December 6th um, to launch our new website, which is a really exciting um, upgrade for our members um, because now, from now on, our members will be able to post their own content and promotions on their own webpage on our website. So we're really excited about that. So as the holiday season comes up, um, we're going to be moving into having quarterly by local programs, so we'll be looking at the building industries in, in the spring and um, services and food in summer and fall. So we've got lots of exciting things coming. So stay tuned. If you're not on our mailing on our newsletter list, sign up, um, like us on Facebook, and uh, stay tuned because we've got some big changes and exciting things coming up. So thanks again to Dave and to all of you for coming.